All right, um, looks like we have everyone. So I'll call to order uh, the Green Map Care Board's uh, meeting of August 2nd, 2023. And we have uh, two agenda items today. Uh, first is the Interim Director of Healthcare Reform from AHS, Pat Jones, will be uh, doing a presentation relating to an update on the all pair model. And then our Director of Health Systems Policy, Sarah Kinsler, will provide an update on Act 167. Uh, the Green Mountain Care Board provided a, uh, a press release this week um, relating to uh, our retention of a consultant who's going to help with the community engagement process, which we're excited about and that we're glad we got that underway. And huge thanks to the contracting team and everyone that put in all the effort to get there, including our colleagues at AHS. Um, and with that, I'll turn it to our executive director for the executive director's report. Thank you, Chair Foster. So um, this month, the month of August, we're going to be finishing up our rate review work. Um, those decisions, the qualified health plan decisions will be out on August 7th, um, but then we will turn immediately to hospital budgets. The hearings start on uh, next Wednesday, August 9th, and today we're opening up a, a special public comment period. And we're accepting public comments on the FY24 hospital budget submissions. Uh, we'll run this comment period through Friday um, at uh, actually noon on Friday, August 25th. And the board will begin, begin deliberations on those budgets on Wednesday, August 30th. Um, all the information regarding the hospital budgets are can be found on our website under hospital budget. And then if you click on FY24 budgets, you'll see a schedule of the hearings and all of the submissions and just reach out if anyone needs help finding those. Um, and then uh, as a reminder, we are continuing to accept public comments regarding a next potential model, which we'll hear more about today from um, Pat Jones and any of those comments we receive, we do share with our colleagues at AHS and the governor's office. And with that, I will turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Um, before we turn to Ms. Jones, I'll take up the meeting minutes from July 14th, um, 2023. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? Time of approval. Second. I'll second. Any board discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 And the board unanimously approves the minutes from July 14th. Um, Ms. Jones really needs no introduction. She's one of our favorite people to work with, and I'm glad that you're here, and I really appreciate you doing this, uh, Pat. So I'll turn it to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chair Foster, and thanks for letting me um, come again uh, today to um, provide additional updates on the potential future um, model with Medicare. Um, so uh, I think uh, someone will be sharing the slides, I hope. Yeah, I see that happening. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so um, we can go ahead right to the second slide. Um, we do have some additional information as of yesterday on the timing of the future model with uh, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation. Um, so they, I think, you know, we've covered this material in the past, but they are definitely moving in the direction of um, multi-state models. Um, so there will not be a Vermont specific model and they've outlined seven priorities that will be central to the model and i'll talk about those on the next slide but we do have some um, additional information on the timing we learned as of yesterday that cmmi is planning to release more details on the model in early December. And that will um, come in the form of a notice of funding opportunity. And so when that is released, um, states will be invited to apply to participate in the model. If Vermont or any other state um, decides that they do want to seek participation in the model, 
uh, the proposals or applications um, will be due in March of 2024. We had mentioned before that CMMI has informed states that full implementation of the model won't um, occur in 2025, um, but they're looking to 2026, um, calendar year 2026, as the first full year for that model. So um, we're currently negotiating with CMMI on what 2025 will look like. Our hope would be that it would provide a smooth transition to um, a new model in 2026. And at the same time, we're continuing to discuss um, the potential 2026 model. So um, late breaking news on the on the timing of when that notice of funding opportunity will be released and when applications from states are likely to be due. Next slide. So you've seen this slide before, um, but it bears repeating. These are the priorities that CMMI is signaling that they will be looking for in a new model. So the first is that it will include global budgets for hospitals. Um, the second is that they're um, looking for total cost of care targets um, in, in addition to the hospital global budgets. They um, want a model that is all payer, so that includes Medicare, Medicaid, and commercial payer participation. They um, are, are interested in seeing goals for minimum investments in primary care, so a clear focus on supporting primary care. CMMI wants to see safety net providers engaged in the model from the start, so that um, includes our critical access hospitals and FQHCs. They want to want the model to address uh, mental health, substance use disorder, and social determinants of health, and they want to see health equity addressed as well. Um, so um, that those are really the seven um, payment design elements and core principles that we've seen in um, in CMMI's potential future model. Next slide. So um, this summarizes um, what you know. Why are we interested in continuing to include Medicare in Vermont's healthcare reform efforts? Um, you know, first of all, um, Vermont is a um, low-cost state for Medicare, and so you know, having Medicare involved in alternative payment models continues to recognize that status. And um, similarly, if, if we continue to have Medicare participation, some of those baseline financial calculations that they might do in a future model would really recognize some of our past reforms um, that have saved money and also um, resulted in care delivery improvements. And I'm going to spend a good chunk of my time today talking about some of those reforms and how we're communicating a desire to um, continue to, um, to be able to pursue those. Having Medicare um, involved as well certainly gives us some ability to influence um, reimbursement for Vermont's health care providers. It also um, continues the investment from Medicare in the blueprint for health, including payments to primary care practices that have been recognized as patient-centered medical homes. Um, investments in community health teams in each region of the state and the support and services at home program um, that supports Medicare beneficiaries in their homes. So 
uh, you know, at the point at which Medicare were not to continue to be involved in alternative payment models um, with Vermont, those investments for the Medicare portion would go away. We also have some um, waivers of uh, Medicare regulations that are included in the current model and that we would hope to see in future models. And um, a future model could give us the ability to propose new waivers of regulations as well. And those can support improvements in care delivery. And then finally, um, the alignment that we see um, across payers in um, priorities, payment models, quality measures um, can be beneficial to our health system and can send a, a signal to um, all of our healthcare system partners. Next slide. So um, the healthcare reform work group that's um, currently meeting monthly was initiated in June of 2022. And there are a number of um, sub subgroups as well. And there are four areas of work that that group outlined. And the first was short-term provider stability. That work is ongoing. The second is um, the impact of the regulatory environment on stability, also ongoing. Um, financial and care model um, was a third area of work, and that's the one um, that I'd like to focus on today. And then um, models for long-term hospital stability, and that's um, part of the work that Sarah will be talking about as well today. Next slide. So we have, um, you know, tried to provide some broad feedback to CMMI as we've engaged in um, discussions about um, potential future models. And so some of the really important needs that we've um, that we've communicated to them include the importance of support for rural provider stability and sustainability um, with a you know, particular emphasis on the workforce challenges that we're seeing and um, healthcare inflation impacts. And you know, these are not unique to Vermont by any stretch, um, but rural areas um, can have particular challenges, um, especially in the workforce arena. And so we have emphasized that. Um, the second is um, the importance on having predictable payments for the healthcare system. A third area of feedback um, is really relates to Vermont being a low cost Medicare state. And that is ensuring that um, we attain the right amount of revenue to support uh, healthcare system stability. Support for investments in primary care um, and community and uh, preventive care and community care is another area that we've emphasized in our discussions, making sure that there is alignment across payment models and quality measures as much as possible. I mean, there may be some variation among payers, but to the extent that we can align, it is, you know, we've heard um, repeatedly from our healthcare partners that that is beneficial. And then um, finally, allowing Vermont to continue to keep moving forward on our important healthcare reform efforts. And that includes care for people with complex health and social needs, um, support for primary care through programs such as the Blueprint for Health and comprehensive payment reform and support for community-based services. And so what I'd like to do today is really um, focus my time on, on the communication we've been providing around support for investments in preventive and community care and allowing us to move forward on um, those important healthcare reform efforts. Next slide. So the Blueprint for Health um, is um, 
clearly one of Vermont's signature um, payment and care delivery reforms. Um, it's been in place statewide since about um, 2011, and it um, has really um, provided some focus um, on primary care and on care for people with complex needs. So um, two of the core components for the Blueprint for Health are um, support for patient-centered medical homes. These are primary care practices that have been recognized as um, patient-centered medical homes by the National Committee for Quality Assurance. Um, they meet high stand, you know, high quality standards for, um, you know, preventive care, care coordination. Um, and so that is sort of the key building block for the Vermont Blueprint for Health. The second core component is um, regional community health teams. So in each health service area, um, there are multidisciplinary teams. They address, um, you know, work to address uh, unmet health care needs. They include a wide variety of staff members. You know, the region decides um, to a great degree what the staffing for community health teams will look like based on their community needs, but frequently it includes nurses, care coordinators, social workers, counselors, health educators, and health coaches, registered dietitians, um, community health workers, et cetera. And in some cases, the staff are located centrally within um, each health service area and serve as a shared resource. And that can be really helpful for smaller practices and their patients. And in some cases, um, staff are embedded in practices um, that have sufficient patient volumes. But the, the point is to have a multidisciplinary team that really supports um, patients' access um, to preventive services, coordinated care, and care for um, complex needs. So those were the original core components of the Blueprint for Health, and they continue to exist today. Next slide. The Blueprint has also served as a platform for some additional innovations. And um, so three of those are, are outlined here. The first is the Hub and Spoke program for people with opioid use disorder. And um, so there are two components to that. It's a Medicaid funded program. Um, and I should have mentioned actually on the prior slide that those core services are um, supported by all payers. So they're supported by Medicare through um, the current uh, all payer model program. Medicaid um, was sort of the original um, supporter and also um, our commercial health insurance partners. Uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield, MVP, and Cigna. So those um, those two core services are provided and supported by all payers. Um, these services are currently um, Medicaid um, supported, but again, the blueprint has served as a platform for these additional services. So um, the hubs um, are managed in the hub and spoke program are managed by the Department of Health, and they provide intensive um, treatment um, for um, people with opioid use disorder. And then there's also community um, office-based treatment services, and that's um, what we have referred to as spokes. So often primary care providers, some specialist providers as well, that is um, supported and managed by the blueprint, and it provides um, mental health and um, nursing services for people with um, opioid use disorder. A second um, program is um, what's currently called the Women's Health Initiative or in the process of um, you know, thinking about the name of that program, but um, that really is um, intended to um, provide 
primary care and, and preventive services for women of childbearing age around um, pregnancy and tension. And um, that's a program that has also um, been supported by the Blueprint Medicaid funding only, um, but it allows for um, you know, screening and brief um, intervention in offices and then referral to health and community services as needed. And then finally, support and services at home, which has been um, around the longest of these three initiatives. This is actually um, Medicare, largely Medicare funded, but it provides wellness nurses and care managers um, to serve Medicare beneficiaries, elderly and um, disabled folks who either live in congregate housing or in nearby communities. So provide, it provides um, extra resources for those Medicare beneficiaries. Next slide. I think most of you know that um, we are engaged in an expansion of the Blueprint program at this point in time. Um, so we're expanding funding. Um, the legislature approved Medicaid um, funding to, um, to implement a two-year pilot. Um, the goal here is to improve access to mental health and substance use disorder services and to address social determinants of health um, by integrating resources with primary care. And the rationale for that is that, um, you know, we're experiencing increased deaths from drug overdose and suicide. Um, and, you know, there's concerning levels of acuity as well um, for mental health and substance use disorder. So a real need to provide additional resources in primary care um, to help meet those complex needs. Um, we also, um, feel we need to really focus on identifying and addressing social determinants of health and housing instability is an area um, that we believe needs particular focus. And the objective here is really to make sure that there are additional services and supports within primary care that can be used to serve um, um, all the entire population in the practice. Next slide. <laughs> so um, that summarizes the blueprint for health. And that's, um, you know, we've really focused hard in our discussions with CMMI on the need to preserve um, those programs and investments. And in addition, um, Medicaid, the Medicaid program has developed a number of alternative um, payment models for um, a variety of services. And um, that's been really, uh, uh, you know, supported by the healthcare reform work and the, and the um, current model. And so we, again, wanna make sure that we're um, continuing to, support these innovations as well. So there are eight different payment reform projects that are currently um, managed by um, Medicaid, it includes the Vermont Medicaid Next Generation ACO program, which is the Medicaid component of the all-payer model. Um, we also have a mental health payment reform initiative that provides an alternative payment model for adult and children's mental health services provided by our designated mental health agencies. We have an alternative payment model for residential substance use disorder um, programs. We have a model for applied behavior analysis um, for children living with autism. Um, there's an alternative payment model there as well. Um, in earlier um, stages of implementation, but a very complex um, project relates to services for people with developmental um, disabilities. Um, so we've um, done some um, significant preliminary work there. That one is still in the design phase. 
um, children's integrated services, um, providing services um, for um, early childhood that um, has an alternative payment model as well. Um, one of our newer projects is a high technology nursing services payment reform initiative for both children and adults um, who are living um, in their homes and reliant on um, high tech services. That's with the home health agencies. It's a small program, um, but an interesting alternative payment model there. And then um, the Brattleboro Retreat also has an alternative payment model. So, you know, while there's a lot of talk right now about um, hospital global budgets because that's one of the key elements of the um, of the model that we expect CMMI to put forth. Um, we think it's um, critically important that we continue to have um, support for predictable, reliable payments that um, allow flexibility in how um, care is delivered. Uh, and the blueprint is emblematic of that, and these payment reform initiatives are emblematic of that as well. Um, so really, you know, Vermont um, thinking about healthcare reform is really thinking about the whole system um, and our um, home and community-based providers, primary care, as well as hospitals. Next slide. Another area that we've um, tried to communicate with um, CMMI about is um, around, and I had mentioned it in an earlier slide, but um, waivers of um, certain Medicare regulations. Um, some of these waivers can really help support improvements in care delivery. And an example of that is that in our current model, there's a waiver of, um, the, the, there's a requirement that there be a three-day inpatient stay prior to someone um, who um, is eligible for um, Medicare-covered post-hospital um, services in a skilled nursing facility. So um, our current model has a waiver of that requirement that there be that three-day inpatient hospital stay. So that's an example of, you know, sometimes there's some regulations that um, they, they can be improved upon. And so we're um, in the process of communicating with um, CMMI around um, what some additional waivers some are in our current model. Some are waivers that were part of the public health emergency that we think it makes sense to continue. Um, others are um, waivers that we're seeing CMMI offer in other alternative programs. And so we think it's um, really important to have some options there um, to support improvements in care delivery. So. Um, we have, you know, the work group, and then there was a subgroup that um, looked carefully at potential um, waiver requests and highlighted areas of greatest interest, and we'll be um, communicating those to CMMI. We already have, and um, and hope to have some flexibility there. Next slide. And then, um, you know, another area that we um, that we're quite interested in, and we, you know, I think nationally this is an area of interest. But you know, how do we um, support um, successful coordination among providers? Uh, you know, to reduce fragmentation, but to also support. Um, good care coordination when it's happening. And so one area that we've looked at is um, what are some some measures that are currently in place um, that really demonstrate um, good coordination between two or more providers on behalf of people with complex health needs. And we're calling them shared interest measures or shared interest payments. So um, some of the measures that we um, have you know, again, have communicated to CMMI that we have interest in include readmissions, um, follow up after hospitalization for mental illness, 
follow up after um, ED visits for mental illness and follow up after ED visits for substance use disorder. And then there's a set of measures called prevention quality indicators that look at potentially avoidable hospitalization for people with um, conditions that um, can be managed and are sensitive to um, ambulatory care. So these all look at, um, you know, what's happening, someone's in the hospital, what's happening in the community um, when they leave the hospital, how can we, or, or are they, they're in the community and how can we prevent hospitalization? So it really speaks to um, the work between hospital uh, providers and community-based providers. Now, um, certainly the first four measures are currently in a number of our models. Um, so, um, you know, we've already got them in place, but the question is how can we use um, performance on these to um, encourage and support uh, good coordination among providers? Next slide. So next steps, um, we will um, continue to um, meet with CMMI. Um, we're continuing to gather input from our work groups, um, from advisory groups at both the AHS and uh, the Green Mountain Care Board, um, you know, from these presentations, public comments, as uh, Susan mentioned earlier. And, you know, when the time comes when that model is actually released and we have more detail and um, it's public, um, we will be carefully reviewing it to see if it is a model that is beneficial to Vermont and we'll continue to um, gather input as we um, formulate that response for early in 2024. And I think that is the close of my slides. I think there's a timeline slide actually. Yeah. Um, so, you know, this just reiterates the um, timeline, the tentative timeline. Again, we now have a little more information um, as of yesterday. Fall of 2023 is actually looking like um, early December of 2023. Um, and then March of um, 2024 is when uh, those applications would be due from interested states. We'll continue to, um, you know, inform uh, you all as we as we um, begin to move forward on that. Then later in 2024, um, there would be negotiations with uh, CMMI. Um, so trying at this point to understand what 2025 will look like. Um, and then if there's a decision made to move forward by both us and CMMI, then 2026 is when that multi-state model is intended to launch. So I think that is um, the end of my slides. Thank you again for the chance to, um, to speak to you today. Thank you, um, Ms. Jones. Uh, I had one question, which I think I know the answer to, but maybe for others. Um, on your timeline slide for the bridge year of 2025, can you speak to sort of the expected timeline on when we'll have a sense of what that might look like? And I know it's actively being negotiated, so it might not be totally yeah. clear. Yeah, um, I would um, certainly hope that by the end of this year, we would um, have a very good sense of what 2025 is going to look like. We're hearing from um, CMMI that, you know, I, I think it's safe to say around the end of the year, they have um, clearance processes that they have to go through if there are any changes. Um, you know, we're in active um, discussion with them, but I would say the end of the year would be a good bet. Uh, thank you. Uh, any other comments or questions from board members? I have a quick question, if that's all right, Chair Foster. Please. Um, 
Pat, thank you so much. It's always wonderful to see you here. And thanks for your continued hard work for the state. So appreciated. Um, I'm wondering if you can just talk about CMMI's appetite to provide um, transformational resources to help providers, you know, shift from fee for service to global budgets. Any talk of a federal state funding match as we had in the last model? Yeah, I can't, I, I have no specifics and can't give you any specifics, but I can tell you that it is a, um, a, a priority topic of discussion. And I'd, I'd put it into two buckets. One is, um, you know, um, transformation dollars um, for the state, um, because there will be some, obviously, some changes that need to be made if we embark on a new model. But more importantly, um, transformation dollars for providers to make those changes in um, care delivery, um, payment models, and so forth. So I can't tell you um, whether, you know, any details, but I can tell you that it is an area that we have um, talked about with them. And, you know, I, I haven't gotten the sense that they do not have an appetite for it. So I think they understand that, um, that you know, changes of the magnitude that we're looking at with some of these models, whether it's the, you know, the model that we're talking with them about or other multi-state models, that they really um, are a heavy lift for um, providers. And so um, hopefully that will translate into some support um, for care delivery transformation. Yeah, and I, I mean, my thought was, I was largely thinking about the provider community and the transformational dollars there. Have we done any internal estimates um, on what we think the transformational cost might be so that we can make that ask or include that in our proposal? Or, you know, do we have any internal estimates of what it would take to transform our system? Yeah, I can't say we have firm estimates at this point in time. I will tell you that, you know, and we don't have details about the model either, but um, I think that's a, um, a good recommendation. So when when we get a bit more detail as we talk to our partners, um, I think it's an important question to ask. So thank you. No, oh, great. And I guess my final question is just, I, I, we had, I know we had hoped um, that this NOFA would be out in fall. Now it sounds like it's December. Um, do you and your team feel like the turnaround time, December to March, is, I mean, what does that look like in terms of um, being able to digest the, you know, the model and then be able to put together a reasonable app? Does that feel like that's a doable? I guess it yeah, must be. Yeah, it feels like it's going to be a very busy holiday season. Um, but yeah. um, we, you know, um, part of the work we've been doing um, to date is to try and, um, you know, begin to build our thoughts around um, what kind of a model would work for us, um, getting feedback from um, various uh, participants in the healthcare system. And so I do think that, um, you know, we, we weren't sure if we were going to get a two month turnaround or a three month turnaround. We had heard anywhere from 60 to 90 days. And it looks like based on what was released yesterday that we are, um, that, that states will have 90 days to respond. And again, I'll emphasize, should they decide to apply for this program? So 90 days feels better than 60 days. Um, it still feels like a, um, a pretty rapid time frame, given that, you know, we'll be getting details um, later in the, I guess you could still call it fall because it's, before the first official day of winter, but um, it is later than what, what we thought it was going to be. So, well, it was 48 90... degrees this morning when I woke up, and I would say that doesn't seem like August's whatever yeah. weather to me. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, 90 so days you. feels better than 60. I'll, yeah. I'll well, I'm glad to that. hear that. I'm yeah. glad to hear that. Yeah. Thanks for all your hard work on this, Pat. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I have a couple comments and a question. and. 
Pat, it's a little bit of a an aside from the main topic, but anytime we talk about the blueprint programs, I just really feel I need to comment on them. Um, in my other life working as an emergency physician, I, I cannot tell you the importance of these programs and the, the lives of the patients that I see. And I, I, I just, there's a few that you brought up that I just want to talk about real quickly. The community health teams, care coordination, social workers, uh, dietitians. These are the impact. These are so hard. To, the impact of these is so hard to measure, but the impact is so palpable. And so I think this gets a little bit complicated in, in health policy conversations, and we're you know wanting to try to figure out the measurement to measure the benefits of these programs. But to the people's lives that they touch, they're just they're 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 massive. They're incredible, and I and they're hard to measure because they're very intangible things that I think are hard to define a metric. So I'd still just encourage and to continue with them. I'm just so happy that 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 they're available. The hub and spoke model and the access that it provides, um, which, you know, it's it's difficult to staff, but it's still, again, incredible difference in people's lives to be able to get treatment for opiate use disorder and now expanding it to alcohol use. Um, uh, you know, we've been really fortunate in the state that uh, the Brattleboro Retreat has been able to, you know, return their capacity, the bed capacity they have back up to to what I think was it was prior to COVID went down for a while, which has made a huge difference in mental health boarding and emergency departments throughout the state. But again, I really can't emphasize enough my appreciation for the pilot program uh, to improve outpatient mental health capacity that you discussed. Again, it, it just it's but when working clinically, this is just a daily thing that we experience that patients need more, more access to outpatient mental health resources. The, the need is so, so massive and the, the, the impact is so important. Um, one thing I want to bring up that I see in my work is the one of the metrics that we rely on is the ED follow up after an ED visit for substance use disorder and alcohol use disorder. And I'm very fortunate to work in a place where we have great recovery coaches in the region and they do the majority of of that work and I I think do it quite effectively um, but I think they don't get counted because they're not filing claims so I actually think probably the work that we're doing in the state um, and the successes we are having is beyond what we're capturing in claims because so many people are following up with recovery coaches and getting uh, in, involved in, in a culture of recovery. And yes, it's, you know, there's no way they can get a 100% success rate, but if they get a 10% success rate, it's a better uh, intervention than so much of we have in healthcare. So it's it's really important. Um, those were sort of my my comments. My and, and this is a comment slash question, but one thing I, I struggle with a little bit is that being a low cost Medicare state, and a relatively high cost commercial state and a lot of the discussion that's gone over the years about how that has come to be how do we know that we are um we're we're getting the right amount of medicare revenue for the work that's being done to care for the for the medicare population yeah i think you know i think the way we're looking at that is it's really going to be important um if if we are already um low cost and you know it's multifactorial i'm sure but it's um you know the use of services um keeping people at home um rather than in, in the hospital. I mean, one of the findings in a recent evaluation report from CMMI that showed that the current model is in fact um, saving Medicare dollars is that um, there were um, fewer acute hospital admissions and fewer acute hospital days. And so, um, but there are other factors too. I think it's um, a lot of it's the way that um, healthcare is practiced in the state, and some of it might be those other supports that you talked about um, that you're seeing um, in from the blueprint and other programs. But the really important thing um, from our perspective is um, to make sure that um, 
when you're already low cost, finding more savings is um, going to be a challenge. And so that balance between, um, obviously, we all want um, health care to be as affordable as possible. Um, but understanding that if um, we're already low cost, finding more savings um, in Medicare um, could be a challenge. And so a reasonable approach to that from uh, Medicare from CMS is what we would seek. Um, and thank you for um, the comments on the blueprint resources as well, and the and the um, Brattleboro retreat alternative payment model. Um, I will definitely pass that along to my colleagues who um, support and lead those programs over here. But thank you. Thanks, Pat. Um, Pat, I'll just turn to healthcare advocate in case they have any questions or comments, and then we'll do the uh, public comment today at the end of the presentations. Hi, hey, Mr. Becker, how are you? Um, well, Chair Foster, thank you. Um, just to thank you to Pat Jones for the presentation. Other than that, we have no specific comments. Thank you. <clears throat> Great. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Ms. Jones. Um, appreciate your time today and for the update. And uh, next, we'll hear from uh, Sarah Kinsler on the Act 167 work um, with global payment model development and hospital sustainability work. Ms. Kinsler. Hello, all. Thank you so much for having me before the board today. Um, for the record, this is Sarah Kinsler, Director of Health, Health Systems Policy at the board. Um, so I'm going to um, follow past update with a kind of coordinated update. Uh, uh, continuing uh, down the rest of the Act 167, Sections 1 and 2 work streams. Um, so as a reminder, um, today Pat presented on our green box here. Um, I'll, uh, last week, um, or excuse me, last month, or perhaps it was even the very end of June, I haven't quite gotten used to it being August yet, um, I provided a, an update on kind of the rest of the work uh, we're undertaking under Act 167, Sections 1 and 2. Um, today, that, that update will be a little bit more focused. Uh, I should note that Pat and I are going to try to bring these kind of tag team updates uh, back to the board every month or so, um, or every you know four to six weeks over the course um, of the next few months so that we can uh, keep the board and the public updated on um, this work because it's, uh, there's a lot a lot going on uh, and we want to make sure that um, you're all aware of that progress and have opportunity to um, to ask questions and provide your input um, so today i'll um, i'll repeat a little bit of what i said last time i was here um, regarding the global budget uh, work um, and then i have some uh, information to share about the community and provider engagement uh, effort to support hospital transformation um, which chair foster alluded to at the beginning of the meeting um, so on the global budget tag, um, I, I'm, and I'm being a little bit repetitive here because I think it bears repeating because this work is very complex. And so I want to, I want to um, continue to highlight uh, there's some very active technical work happening behind the scenes, um, you know, in, in engagement with the Office of the Healthcare Advocate, um, with uh, representatives of hospitals, with representatives of payers. Um, with um, representatives of uh, unions um, and other um, other entities as well. Um, so we're working on kind of technical design planning and options. Um, and so I want to keep talking about this work, even though um, not all that much has changed since late June. Um, we uh, were forced to cancel a meeting and push our work back a little bit um, due to the flooding. Um, and so this is kind of Continuing, continuing to evolve. Um, we are um, having our technical advisory group react to a straw model for members of the public. I should note that um, the straw model is presented as slides. Those slides are now posted um, on the on the TAG website, so anyone can go explore that with us. That was the first exploration of kind of a how it could work. Um, in the meantime, over the rest of the summer and the fall, we're gonna really keep tackling key issues as we continue to improve our data and improve our straw model. Um, some of those issues are going to be supporting care transformation. So thinking about the work 
um, and, and how to um, ensure that uh, any global budget model could support broader care transformation, which is what Pat discussed earlier, um, the terms of payer participation and how that might vary across payer types and between payers within the same payer type, um, terms of hospital participation, budget calculation and payment options, so really talking about the administrative functions, um, as well as monitoring and evaluation which is going to be um, a, a critical topic that we'll be getting to uh, in you know, the last quarter of the year. Um, some key areas of the methodology that I hope that um, you know, we will engage board members on in the coming months. And again, this is um, you know, the, the same slide that I presented in June is we're really gonna wanna talk about these critical pieces of the me methodology, um, like the base budget and how it is set, annual trends and adjustments, how we move forward from that base year and how we how we balance um, our goals of keeping up with inflation and costs, ensuring it's a sustainable payment model, while also um, factoring in affordability and ensuring that Vermonters can um, can afford to pay for their health care. Um, the regulatory mechanism, um, a, a question near and dear to our hearts, I know, um, as well as the quality framework, monitoring and evaluation, um, and and really how do we um, how do we tie quality to payment, but what's the broader uh, monitoring and evaluation mechanism so that we can make sure that we are um, closely following um, this work and um, and really seeing the impacts across the system. Um, so that's all on, on global budgets. Um, again, that work uh, is you know very active and will continue to be through the fall. Um, the outcome of that work is a kind of draft technical document that we can um, review more broadly and we'll be working more closely um, with you know a broader set of um, of providers and ensuring that you know hospitals have a chance to get really familiar with what is being discussed um, so that we can get in-depth feedback from across the system um, so on the community and provider engagement work um, to support hospital transformation this is act 167 section 2 um, in Act 167, the legislature directs the Green Mountain Care Board um, to, uh, to host, convene um, a data-informed, patient-focused, community-inclusive engagement process for Vermont hospitals. Um, this has been uh, uh, the topic of uh, much discussion as we've gone through kind of the procurement and contracting process. Uh, and we last month signed a contract with um, Oliver Wyman, a consulting firm that is um, has significant expertise in um, health system design and transformation, significant expertise uh, in facilitating complex community conversations, uh, and also has worked in Vermont for a, a very long time as a contractor for the Department of Financial Regulation. They led the wait time study that happened a year or two ago. Um, so this is a contractor that we think knows Vermont very well and will be able to really ably lead this process. Um, they will be reviewing data and soliciting local input uh, and really developing options to ensure that Vermonters have sustained access to affordable care. Um, they'll be going out into communities to host um, large public meetings um, uh, as well as doing kind of more targeted engagement um, with uh, you know hospitals themselves as other as well as other key stakeholders. Um, in addition, a current contractor, uh, Mathematical Policy Research, will be providing data analytics support. Um, member Holmes, to the question that you asked earlier of Pat in terms of a, an estimate of the cost of actually doing transformation, um, that is actually part of uh, Act 167, Section 2, and is something that we are kind of required to price out um, as part of that legislation. So that's something that's built into these contracts to have these contractors working together to help us figure out, you know, for the solutions that Oliver Wyman is proposing. What is that, what does that cost? What does it cost the state? What does it cost providers? Um, so hopefully that gets us at least part of the way to, um, to answering that question. Um, there is more information available um, on the page that I've linked on these slides um, about the process itself, uh, as well as um, a, a way to sign up to get more information um, about uh, these public meetings that will be held. Um, so our the team that has led this, and I, I would really love to shout out uh, Marissa Melamed and Hillary Watson on our team who are leading this work um, and, and uh, managing these contracts. Um, they're an incredible team that has um, really put so much work into, into this uh, and into kind of uh, announcing this launch yesterday. 
Um, so Hillary and Marissa um, were able to set up a form on our website so that folks were interested, um, whether that be members of the, the public who are attending our meeting today, legislators and their constituents, um, people who work for healthcare organizations, really um, anyone who's interested uh, in hearing more information about these meetings uh, and seeing the materials and attending these meetings when they happen uh, is welcome to sign up uh, and you can sign up to kind of receive alerts about meetings that would occur in your community. Um, so community meetings are, are slated to begin in the fall. Outreach and scheduling will begin uh, this month. The contract officially launched yesterday, August 1st. Uh, so we're diving right into it. Um, and and we, um, we are excited to uh, see where that will land. And, and board members will certainly be working with you to ensure that um, we can get your attendance at uh, those meetings as well. Um, and to conclude, I wanted to offer um, a, a kind of updated version of the slide that I presented in June talking about um, highlighting those opportunities, both for places where we know board, we will we will want board member input and we'll be seeking um, your feedback um, for the all payer model for global budgets and for this community engagement effort, as well as opportunities for the public. So, um, you know, focusing on the purple column. You know, we, we really hope that uh, board members, uh, as well as, you know, a, a robust and diverse group of community stakeholders will be attending these public meetings um, so that we can directly hear the feedback from communities, uh, as well as providing feedback on priorities and options for transformation. Um, and then on the, the public side, we really, um, we want these community meetings to be in depth and robust. So, um, to, to do that, we hope, we, we really encourage folks to, um, sign up for updates and express your interest and we'll also be for Oliver Wyman I should say we'll be working um, you know through through different community groups um, and contacts to ensure robust dissemination there as well and that's all I have for you today thank you very much um, uh, I don't have any questions I, I'll make one comment which is I'm really glad that the care board got this work going uh, before I got here because we're now in the midst of rate review and we've received the hospital budgets and you can see how imperative and critical this work is and so just a huge thanks to all of you that got this work in progress so uh it's nothing we have to deal with right now and it's already underway because rate requests were really high this year hospital budget requests are really high and so this work is really timely and i'm glad it's it's underway so thank you all for doing that um, any other board member questions or comments for Ms. Kinsler? Great. Um, uh, Mr. Becker, do you have anything? Hi, Chair Foster. No, just uh, um, uh, thank you to Sarah Kinsler for the update. And as you said, um, excited to see this work moving forward and looking forward to attending some of these public engagement meetings in the fall. So thank you very much. Great. And I think it will be really critical to get as broad of public engagement as we can. I mean, it'd be really, we need to make sure that we do that, that we get small businesses, local businesses, community members, patients, everybody, so that that whole spectrum of voices is involved in this process. Um, we sent out a press release this week about it, and I think um, we may need to make sure that we're getting that because it's really critical that to make this work succeed. Um, I'll turn it to public comment via the raise the hand function. I see claps from Mr. Carpenter, so I'll uh, acknowledge that as a public comment. No, it's wrong. I mean, Colin, I'm on a new iPad here. My other oh, no. Broke. Um, just one question. Exactly what is patient centered? <laughs> I asked this as a pa as a former patient and a patient. Miss um, Kinsler or Miss Jones, do you have a would you like to respond to that question? I'll I'll right. be glad to give it a try, but um, you know, would certainly <clears throat> welcome others as well. Um, and and I assume that um, the references to patient-centered medical homes. Um, I think you know for you know the idea is that um, 
care is delivered in a way um, that that meets the person's needs, that allows them to choose who delivers the care, how the care is delivered. Um, and one of the key elements in the patient-centered medical home recognition requirements is that it be well coordinated among providers. Someone with complex needs um, might be receiving care from a variety of care providers. And so um, we would want them to, um, you know, have input as to who do they see as sort of their primary care provider, pr primary person delivering care, who is on their care team, um, who um, who from their um, family or from their um, circle is part of that care team, and how can that care be delivered in the most um, coordinated way that's responsive to their needs? I mean, in essence, um, you know, the person should be directing um, their care. And if I might add, I, I interpreted your question a little bit differently, Mr. Carpenter. Um, I, Walter's is, are you fine, also no referring, <laughs> Thanks, Walter. Um, also referring, as also referring to the, the legislative language of kind of a um, patient-centered community, or excuse me, data-informed, patient-focused, and community-inclusive engagement process. Um, and I could respond uh, in how I'm kind of conceiving of that, if that would be helpful. Well, I was thinking that the patient is so often referred to as a consumer. So how is patient centered different from patient as a consumer or is it one and the same thing under a different umbrella? Me, it's not in, in this it's particular. The, the legislature does it, you know, mm -hmm. Congress does it, me, it you know, I see it all the time. <laughs> Yeah, that's absolutely the case. And I think that the consumer language has been kind of more in vogue um, over the past few years. Um, but, you know, maybe that that pendulum is shifting a little bit. In terms of the Act 167 uh, community engagement process, I think of the legislature's instruction here of, is, as really being, um, it, it needs to have uh, the individual's experience of care at the center um, of, of our of our thinking as we think about what a healthcare system could look like in the future, um, and, and that um, we we really cannot just be collecting feedback um, from um, you know organizations, um, whether they be um, you know provider organizations or payers or the lobbying groups um, or even the advocates. We really need to hear directly from Vermonters um, about their needs um, and and what they think is most critical to have um, locally in their communities uh, and, and how they would advocate for their healthcare um, experience to transform and their healthcare organizations to transform. I think I was working a little off Dave Merman's comments about the blueprint and stuff and what that does for people and why can't we think of the whole healthcare system along those lines rather than as patient-centered or other terms. I'll yield the floor. We need more David Mermans. Uh, agreed, Owen. <laughs> um, I, I, I share Sarah's view that to me, patient-centered means that this process of, of informing ourselves of how to do this work means the patients are participants and inform us of their experiences and that we have that view that's driving uh, some of the outcome and, and suggestions and thinking in this process. So starting with the patient, what are they getting? What are they not getting? What are their experiences? And informing ourselves about that, because I think that's your point, and I think it's really important. Um, I'll turn real quick to Member Walsh, because see his hand went up, and then the next hand is Ms. Aronoff, and then Mr. Hoffman. Thanks, Chair Foster, and, and hello, Walter. I just wanted to take a moment to um, take a stab at your question. Um, I agree with everything that Pat and, and Sarah and Owen have said. Um, I think in addition to what they've said, what um, in my clinical work and in my policy work, 
um, things that I've written, the, the kind of the rules when we think about patient-centered. Um, what that is trying to do is to, to make providers aware that we need to document our efforts to better understand what matters most to patients. And then oftentimes when they when treatment decisions need to be made, there's more than one option. We have multiple options to choose from for a given condition. And those different options have different risks, different benefits. And two people with the same condition facing the same options may choose differently depending on their values. And throughout the history of healthcare, the decision about what treatment to pursue was deferred to the provider. It's only been since the mid 2000s that we've started saying, hey, we need to document that we've engaged patients and tried to understand what matters most to them. We've gone to great lengths to explain the options that are available and we've helped them uncover their values. And then we include those values in the decisions we move forward with. I, so that's the long-winded answer. I'd say yeah. it's it's not seen much yet. It's talked about a lot, but you may not have experienced it much yet. I haven't experienced it much in my care. But it's aspirational, and that's what we're that's what we're trying to do, and to figure out ways to better pay providers who can do it well. I agree. I, I also read your article in the Washington, was it monthly? But as a patient, I know you are limited by the choices of what your insurance has, for one. There is no such thing as patient choice or patient. It's what the insurer wants, whether it's name them all, that's what it is. Um, you know, you can go to this doctor, that doctor but you can't go to that doctor or this doctor yeah. because the, you know, it's a contract, it's a business, it's the monopolies that we're seeing on and on. So it's a, that's why I asked because it's a great idea. I mean, if it's centered on the patient, but the patient has no choices in the, except what insurance dictates for them in general. We've got a long, we've got a long way to go, Walter. And and I appreciate you raising the question. Four ten on a long way to go, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, Miss Aronoff, Mr. Hoffman, you guys switch places on my numbering here. Um, yeah, that that was my fidgety hand, and I've got a two o'clock meeting um, that I'm actually a participant in, so I I'm, I just will be very brief. Um, really, Pat, um, this is a shout out to, to you for um, your rundown of those payment reforms, there are stories behind every single one of those. Those high-tech nurses for those parents, oh my God, the stories I've heard over the years, for the parents who are entitled to 10 hours, 50 hours, 100 hours, whatever, um, to keep their babies alive and can't get uh, the nurses because the rates are too low. So kudos and shout out. Um, for those payment reforms and for the work that you're doing. My request at this time, so history doesn't repeat itself, is that when you say safety net providers will be included from the start, I'm hoping and assuming that those safety net provide and health equity is a thing. Um, I'm hoping that you will reach out to the health equity advisory committee and to the Developmental Disabilities Council and to some of us others on the scene and bring us in so that we don't go through an all payer model repeat where there's a plan, you know, we all know what happened with the Medicaid pathway and the money that went to the ACOs and not to the uh, designated and specialized services agencies and everyone's misbelief that there was going to be 180 million or whatever it was on that slide out there. Um, so let's not do that again. And please include us, um, us disability advocates. And thanks so much um, for the work that you, you've been doing and are doing that paying parents stuff that came in during the pandemic, keeping that alive. That is just so vital to our community. And before I run, Mr. Chair, I'd just like to put out a request to you that sometime during the 
upcoming months, you consider holding a panel similar to the ones that you've held with other groups? But I don't know if people on the Green Mountain Care Board know it, but um, people with disabilities make up Vermont's largest health disparity group. And people with disabilities have a lot of ideas, some low hanging fruit about what could improve services and what could make things better. And I would be happy to work with Susan or anyone else on putting together a panel on the needs across the life cycle. Because if a person has a disability, the family has a disability. Um, and I, I think that educating the, the board on the needs of people with disabilities um, would be a great service. I'd be happy to be part of putting together. Great, yeah, good suggestion. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for your comment um, and for the suggestion. Um, and now you and Susan can be in touch. Um, Mr. Hoffman, thank you for uh, your patience. Please go ahead. I think you're muted. I think you're unmuted now. Nope. Uh, Mr. Hoffman, can you try and speak? Yeah. Uh, let me try something here. Kristen, are you on or can somebody with more yes, text? Could, could you try and unmute Mr. Hoffman just to see if it's on I our end? I don't have the ability to unmute individuals, unfortunately. OK. OK. We'll give him a, a, a moment. Hi, can you hear me? You can, yes, that sounds great. Okay, I switched over to my mobile. Uh, so I wanted to speak to Dr. Merman's point. Um, as far as Vermont being a low Medicare spend state, um, you know, it reminds me of when he asked uh, during the ACO budget process if ED savings in the Burlington HSA were the result of interventions or poor access. And we really don't know. Um, Ms. Jones, similar to the NORC report, uh, responded with some ideas that could be, might be, possibly be drivers, but we don't know. And um, as I've requested since 2019 with this board, a rigorous approach would be to run a regression analysis between well-documented declines in access. But we're very aware of those declines now. They're well-established. We have year-over-year -year data, lots of rich data. Um, Increased ED utilization, particularly at the Academic Medical Center, well documented. And then actual health outcomes. So run a regression analysis between those. The most important outcome, which you all have never run, but I would again repeat my request that you do is. CDC data is showing increased. Mortality rates. And we can run a regression analysis between those and access. So that's a rigorous response to a very valid 
request by one of your own board members. You have a Can you unmute me? plus budget with a team of data analysts, some of them exceptionally qualified. Can you hear me? I'm thinking of Ms. Lindbergh particularly. You can run this data and find out why, or at least rule out that similar to his suspicion that poor access in the Burlington HSA is not the real driver of low Medicare spend. So would love to see that run at some time. See you guys put put some of this great horsepower you have to use. The other is a question. Um, with Blue Cross Blue Shield Vermont confirming last week, they're not returning to the ACO. What are we hearing from CMMI? While taxpayers fund CMMI, as well as all of you, the public has no communication with CMI. So you are its proxy, CMCB specifically is, in the all payer model agreement. So what is CMMI's posture to one third of potential attributed lives not being in the model? Interventions or? And what Transparency will you offer us today? Uh, in we really terms don't know. Of letting the public know if uh, and what CMI is in the North Pole to this confirmation uh, last responded week. with ideas. For instance, now that we've confirmed two years, drivers. Hang on, can we pause for a second? Sorry, this is and, uh, so trippy. Because um, <laughs> I requested since 2019 for. Uh, sorry, Mr. Uh, Hoffman, one second. Would be You're on like a analysis between we have a... well documented declines in access. <laughs> it's like if there's very aware of there's a digital places. delay and a reverb. Yeah, I wonder if we were just getting Feedback. his first device. I think yeah, it delayed. went off mute, so he was talking on two devices. I think it might be better now, Chair Foster. Yeah. Okay, sorry about that, Mr. Hoffman. I, there was um. I think there was a delay from your old device coming through. It's really hard to. Uh, so I think you left off where I last heard okay, clarity yeah. was. Yeah, yeah. The last thing I heard with clarity before it was doubling up was um, uh, CMMI, no process for public comment with CMMI for the public to engage with CMMI. And uh, you were asking about the posture with CMMI to the ACO. That's where the last part I heard. Yeah. So. Uh, with the confirmation of year two, one third of attributed lives being out of the model, that would be a triggering event per the all payer model agreement, which ordinarily would necessitate a corrective action plan. So we have the confirmation. I suppose we could wait till 2025 to then look back and say two years of failed scale. Um, I would say that the the scale waiver for the state is not dispositive in terms of this additional loss of Blue Cross lives. So this is not covered under that previous scale target waiver. Um, so what, if anything, will you share in terms of feedback, CMMI, again, the taxpayers funds and that you act as proxy for, has given in terms of its concerns about one third of commercial or basically all commercial lives not being in the model. and. Um, Particularly, what what is the impact of that for a 2025 bridge year? So, how do you even begin to vision a, a bridge year? Moreover, beyond the bridge year, if we don't even know how we're getting one third of Vermonters into the model, is it anything you all would be willing to share today with the public since we can't access the MMI? Um, I, I think I'll say. First, um, that I have heard of some public comment and communication with CMMI. I don't know how much bandwidth they have for that, but I have heard of public speaking with CMMI on some of these issues anyway. Um, and I'll ask Ms. Jones and Ms. Kinsler if there's anything that they can share on this question, because I think it's a relevant one. Um, but some of the negotiations necessarily are confidential because we can't share where they are or where we are until they have gone through some of the clearance. Um, process, um, but I'll turn to Ms. Jones or Ms. Kinsler if there's anything that we're permitted to share at this time with regard to Mr. Hoffman's question. 
Yeah, um, I don't have a lot to share. Um, I can't speak for CMMI in terms of <clears throat> their level of concern. I can say that they're aware um, that Blue Cross is not participating with the ACO. When we think about <clears throat> 2025, um, the focus um, in those discussions really is on what the um, Medicare, um, you know, Medicare's participation in alternative payment models. Thank you. Um, and I'll turn to uh, any new business or old business to come before the board. And I have some that I wanted to bring up if Ms. Sawyer or Mr. McCracken are here. I think Mr. McCracken, you got to run pretty quickly. So I'll try and keep this limited. Oh, and uh, you forgive me. I just have one question. When will the rate decision be made? I don't see it on the calendar. The Blue Cross oh. rate, or the rate decision. Uh, I'm not sure when that will be published. I think pretty soon. The seventh, Within, I believe. And yeah. rate review team, Mike, Mike uh, Barber, back me up. But I believe August seventh, they'll be released. Yeah, so pretty quick. Um, all right, so I'll turn to Ms. Sawyer and Ms. McCracken. We had on June 14th, um, uh, there was a motion and a vote relating to one care executive salaries. If you have any slides relating to what we had decided on June 14th. Do you have the actual motion language from the that hearing? Do one moment. That visible? Yeah. Um, so the second condition that the board approved related to the compensation for one cares executives and the language here, uh, I'll read it. It conditioned the approval of the amendment to one cares fiscal year 23 budget on the requirement that one care modify its fiscal year 23 budget by capping the total compensation for one cares executives VP level and above at the median 50th percentile of the benchmark used by one care to establish its, ex its executive compensation. Amounts budgeted by one care for executive compensation in excess of the median must be allocated instead to one care population health activities. And there's some vagueness in some of this language about capping the total compensation and whether or not that should be at the individual level or the aggregate level. And I want to clarify that and modify it so that the cap would be uh, in total for at the aggregate level. And what I mean by that is that the absolute dollar amount spent on the budget for executives would be at the 50th percentile. But if one care chose to pay one person at the 60th and somebody else at the 40th, that would be permissible. And it would be at the aggregated level and the same amount of money would actually be allocated to uh, one care population health activities. And so I had a motion I want to propose to make this modification to clarify uh, this condition. And what I'm gonna do is I'll read the motion and uh, we can open it up for public comment for a week, and then we can take up the motion next week to see if there's a second and, and to vote on it if there is. Um, but the motion language I'd like to propose for us to consider for next week is uh, I'd move to modify the second condition in the Green Mountain Care Board's June 14th approval of One Care's revised budget so that the cap on executive compensation established in the condition shall be calculated and enforced on an aggregated basis, capping the total combined compensation for One Care's executives, VP level and above, in One Care's fiscal year 23 budget at the total combined amount of the median 50th percentile of the benchmark used by one care to establish the compensation for those executives. The condition is otherwise unchanged. Um, I believe Mr. McCracken has a meeting at 2.30, so I wanted to read that and we can have board discussion uh, next week and we can take any public comment between now and then uh, on this uh, adjustment. And that's all I had on this. Is there any other new or old business? Great. Uh, is there a motion to adjourn? 
I move to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries and thank you everyone for your work and we'll see you, I guess, next week. All right, have a good afternoon.